Hello friends, welcome back to Mac Truck Bookstop. Mike here. Uh, today I'm here to talk about a really good book. Uh, Girl is a Body of Water by Jennifer Nansubuga Makumbi. And this book is actually titled, it has a different title in the UK. It was published as The First Woman. I greatly prefer this title and it's actually a great example of how a title can make a huge difference, um, which I will talk about at some point later on in the video. Um, this book is a recently published one, but the author is well established. Um, she is well known for um, the Kintu Chronicles or so uh, something like that. Um, it was published back in 2014, I want to say. Um, this is her second major novel. Um, the first one, uh, well, both both deal with her home country of Uganda. Um, and the first one deals with kind of the uh, toxic masculinity side of the, of the culture of Uganda. And this one, I would say, deals kind of with the toxic femininity, femininity side of it. Um, some of the notes on it would call it a feminist novel. I don't, um, you know, without being particularly political, I just want to say that uh, I feminist means a lot of different things to a lot of different people, some positive, some negative. Uh, I would personally, the way I approached it and how I would encourage anybody to approach it is to put all that stuff aside, just read the novel, and be open to the questions it's asking because I don't think that um, if you have a negative view of feminism that this book is pushing on it, any, anything on you and um, if you have a positive view of feminism then I think you'll find a lot of uh, questions here worth exploring. So it's um, I think this is great literature personally because it leaves you with a lot of questions, and it gives you very few definitive answers. Um, so with that said, I will try to give a short summary of the plot. Maybe read it. This is a case where I'm just going to read the back of the book, because I think it does a pretty good job, which is rare. Um, in her 13th year, Kirabo confronts a piercing question. Who is my mother? Kirabo has been raised by women in the small Ugandan village of Natera, her grandmother, her best friend, and her many aunts, but the absence of her mother follows her like a shadow. Seeking answers from Nasuda, the local witch, Kirabo learns about the woman who birthed her, who she discovers is alive, but not ready to meet. Nasuda also helps Kirabo understand the emergence of a mysterious second self, a headstrong and confusing force inside her. This, says Nasuda, is a streak of the first woman, an independent, original state that has been all but lost to women. Kirabo's journey to reconcile these feelings, alongside her desire to reconnect with her mother and to honor her family's expectations, is rich in the folklore of Uganda and an arresting exploration of what it means to be a modern girl in a world that seems determined to silence women. Um, yeah, I mean, that's that's decent, but I, I do think there is a lot more to it than um, just the this uh, Kirabo um, overcoming a world that is determined to silence women. I think there is a very nuanced exploration here of different types of um, feminism and in, in uh, or um, attempts of women to manage their surroundings and and uh, in some cases liberate themselves or in some cases um, kind of stand their ground and say this is not my responsibility um, or this is a double standard but then showing that that how that actually has negative impacts on Kirabo and other people around them. Um, in fact, much of this novel shows how, um, how in, I guess, this culture, in this society, women are kind of set up or end up attacking other women. 
And again, I, I really don't feel that in any way that this, this book is trying to say a definitive, like, this is why. I mean, in, in many cases, the end result is it just is, and it, and it sucks, but that is just how it is. And um, there's, a, there's a huge struggle at the heart of the book regarding um, just the name. The name of the U.S. Um, version I like so much better. Because, um, as it mentions, the village witch, Nasuda, which in kind of um, parentheses, Nasuda talks to Kirabo about um, this, this second self that's emerging. And this second self, Kirabo is very not at ease with because it makes her wet the bed. It uh, makes her fly up out of her body like a kind of um, lucid dreaming uh, or astral projection almost. And... Um, it, uh, in the end, um, Kirabu decides she doesn't, she wants this second self, she wants to be rid of this second self, this original state. Um, Nasuda, in this, in this same kind of speech to Kirabu that she gives, telling her that this second state is part of the, the original woman that was independent and strong, um, in the act of doing that, she also talks about how the mythology of women um, being represented as bodies of water, which you can find not just in Ugandan and African cultures, but also in the world at large. I mean, how many mythologies have women originating from water or, um, you know, think of like sirens in Greek mythology. Um, there's a lot of it. And so... And so this mythologizing of women, um, she says, or, or posits, this mythologizing of women actually um, is another type of oppression or um, an encapsulation and denying uh, of, um, of their independence and so on. But I, I think, and, and the book kind of gets at this, um, this, this affects men too. Men are also mythologized and men are also kind of, um, uh, stationed in society. None of, uh, and I feel that none of what I'm saying here is really giving a good sense of why this was such a good book to me, um, because it's almost secondary. Um, what I, what I found so compelling about the book and why I think that somebody should read it is I've never read anything that gave me such a window into what it is like to be a woman. And, after, I'm not going to say, like, okay, I read this book and now I understand what it's like to be a woman. That would be silly. But this book really, um, more than any other, gave me some of that understanding and, and was able to um, kind of go through and explore all the different, you know, ways that a woman might feel frustrated in her situation, uh, ways she might look to get out. I can kind of go chapter by chapter in the spoiler section, but... At this point, I'll say if you want to go into the book without particular spoilers, um, this would be the time to get out of the video. But um, again, I'm going to try not to spoil everything. There's really no reason to um, at this stage when I'm just giving my impressions. I've kind of leaned toward in these videos now to do um, a less spoiler type of review and... Um, more just just stick to impressions because at some point later I would like to do more in-depth analysis of these books and and write something up uh, if I try to do that now it's better to just accept these videos as like it's me spouting what I th what I think about the book um, and moving on so yeah this is the time to leave the video if you don't want any spoilers whatsoever and you're intrigued by what I've already said um, and uh, so th this, um, this book, starting from kind of the first part, there's five parts to the book, uh, and they all have a title, and each one goes chapter 1 through 10 or 1 through 13 or whatever. Each part of the book tackles kind of a different, uh, I want to say, encounter with, um, with uh, finding the female identity for Kirabo.
The first one is encountering Nasuda, the witch, who, as I said, Nasuda is, um, is from an upper-class background and uh, is, um, has a complicated relationship with her family, she, which gets developed later on. Um, let's just leave it at both Nasuda and Kirabo's grandmother um, have had a relationship with Kirabo's grandfather. So um, Nasuda has kind of, um, at the beginning of the book, has inserted herself in the past. That's all you know, that Nasuda in the past has kind of been with Kirabo's grandfather, and for that reason, Kirabo's grandmother seems to not like her. Um, that's, and again, there's mysteries that are revealed as you get, as you get on in the book about this, but um, Nasuda is essentially positing a, a very kind of typical um, uh, Gaia-type religion, like, you know, the, the uh, Earth, a little bit of the Earth Mother kind of idea that, that women before all of this mythologizing of them coming from water, or myths that were imposed by men, say like Adam and Eve, before all this there's like an original woman that was independent. Like, I don't know what you're, what she's really trying to say there, like in the caveman days or something. I don't know. Um, <laughs> but, again, this is one encounter with feminism. So if the book, like, stopped there and said, okay, Nasuda's right, I would kind of be like, I don't know, I don't buy it. But, um, moving on from that, we get a lot of other explorations um, in the second part of the book. Uh, um... Kirabo is sent to the city, and here she meets her uh, stepmother. Um, her father has lived in the city this entire her entire childhood, and this stepmother is not welcoming to Kirabo at all because she has two kids with Kirabo's father, and I guess it should be said that Kirabo doesn't know who her mother is. Um, and, and the, a whole part of the journey of the book is her trying to figure that out. But this, this um, stepmother, kind of on her terms of independence and saying, like, no, is enough, is enough. She says to Kirabo's father, you would not have married me if I had had a kid with another man. And you would not accept that kid from another man, so why should I accept Kirabo? Because you've had her with another woman. And so, of course, we're seeing most of the story from Kirabo's perspective. Um, but, yeah, but so, so you get the sense, like, well, she kind of has a point, her stepmother, but then we're seeing things from Kirabo's, step, or from Kirabo's perspective, and it's like, uh, we see how much the stepmother is rejecting and um, uh, uh, just making life miserable for uh, this 13, 14 year old girl at the time of this chapter, Kirabo. So, um, at this point, uh, uh, Kirabo ends up, of course, getting um, expelled from the house because this stepmother doesn't want to put up with her. Uh, to, to sum it up, there's a lot more that happens, but that's just to sum it up shortly. And then in the next section, she goes to a boarding school, which this was actually one of the most interesting parts of the book to me. Because it's a boarding school that's, and I don't know if this exists in real life in Uganda or whatever, but it's a boarding school that's set up by some nuns to be a kind of utopia where only women are and where women are free from the influence of men and so on and can be free thinkers, be raised to be educated and so on. And they form houses and groups and there's this whole social structure. And this section of the book is called Utopia which, of course, is a very um, satirical, I guess, way, thing to call this chapter, because it is not at all. Um, many of the girls at the school, um, you know, the, when, they, when they can escape, some of them try to escape to go out and find men or, or party or whatever. They also form societies where they're still cruel to each other. They, um, they uh, have all the same normal problems as... Um, a society of all men would. Uh, so the, it's, it's a very interesting, um, it, it really drives home that point that like mythologizing women is somehow um, more, uh, you know, um, spiritual or at peace or like whatever you want to say, whatever you want to say is, 
it, it, it shatters a lot of that mythology of like a, a society of all women and all women being in charge might be like a, a better society. At least that's how I read it. Um, so it's, um, you, you move on for it. So that's like another encounter with a type of feminism, right? So, so far we've had three different encounters with feminism that have all impacted Kirabo in a bad way. And all of them have to do with the fact that women are attacking other women in the society and not um, men, which is really interesting. So then we go into the next, the next um, part, and uh, then we get some backstory as to why Nasuda and Kirabo's grandmother actually um, are at odds. And it has to do with that when they were young, they agreed that they were going to marry the same man. And this leads to the fact that polygamy is a thing in the society, although it's progressively being kind of pushed out by Christian influence. Um, but in, in some sense, the traditional society um, of Uganda, the traditional cultures that allowed polygamy, um, were, were basically putting, you know, these two women in a position where, well, we'd rather get through life with a, with a close friend, with a close woman friend. So these two, like, decide they're going to marry the same man. And they actually try to carry this plan out all the way up to, you know, as far as it can go. And, and you see how that works out, which, spoiler alert, not very well um, for the relationship of these two women, for the most part. So... Then in the final chapter, it, it still gets really good. This is, if I have one criticism of the book, I felt like the final part, part five, was a little bloated. Um, Tom uh, Kirabo's father dies, and this creates a whole, dis uh, at the funeral, this creates a bunch of, like, family drama, and um, then later discussions of how the inheritance is going to be passed, and why you can't pass an inheritance to a woman, because then if she marries somebody down the line then the, the men of that family are going to take everything. So by passing inheritance to a woman, it's like you're, you're losing something from your family because society at large isn't going to respect your sort of um, quote-unquote feminist decision. So there's kind of that issue that comes up. Um, it's such an exploration. And like I said, at no point does this, does this book ever get to the point where I'm like, oh, that's totally unrealistic. Um, and the way it ends, I feel like, is really nice. It's really nice because um, it doesn't give Nasuda... It doesn't say Nasuda was right all along. Far from that. Um, that uh, women need to go back to this original state. In fact, there's this whole see scene where I almost interpreted um, A Girl is a Body of Water, the title of the book. That's actually... That mythology is actually very important to women. Um, the mythology that is part of traditional culture still needs to be recognized, embraced, but then perhaps changed as times change um, and worked with, like, like women can still work within this structure to better their lives, but life is messy and things can't change all at once. And there's so much to think about here, but all of this is underlined, as I said, by the fact that the book really gives you a window into just also the the day-to-day -day existence of women things they have to deal with as a man this is of course all as a man speaking um and how the book impacted me um so of course what i'm saying here is not a definitive interpretation of the book or how you might feel reading it but um personally i will say it was one of the most interesting books i've read in this project so far and i'm, pl I'm pleasantly surprised um especially because some of the other books that I've read that are recently published, um, I didn't like very much. And I think it's telling. I think it's telling that this book um, did not get on any prize lists, like no Booker Prize lists. Um, as far as I know, Jennifer Nansu Nansabuga Makumbi has not been like nominated for any, any major prizes, really. And it's... She, but she's a great writer. She's, I think she's actually better than a lot of the, the the authors that are getting on here. And I wonder, I wonder if the fact that she didn't take a very like radical stance um, regarding feminism, this book has something to do with it. I don't know, um, but in, in leaving it so open, but uh, it, it's. It, it was such a, I thought it was so great because so many books today seem to like want to give you 
that definitive answer instead of letting you just sit with the questions that the book has has asked, um, which to me marks a lot of the great literature of the past. And I think this book did that so well. And um, I, I, I will definitely go back to it and um, read it again, especially if I'm if I'm thinking about certain themes or, or things. I definitely see it as one I would go back to. Um, and as far as giving you a little glimpse into like Ugandan history and culture, it also did a great job um, of that. So uh, yeah, I, I don't know how much I can say beyond that. Um, I uh, hope that I haven't said anything too ridiculous because it's obvious this book was obviously way outside of my comfort zone but that's kind of the point of this project of reading the world so if I do say something dumb well these that's what these videos are for for me to just spout out my first impression and I do hope people comment and give their ideas about about these books and and someday I do want to make um, maybe not videos but podcasts or something about uh, more, a little bit more of an in-depth analysis of these books, more thought out, use more sources, draw, draw ideas from other people, and then kind of um, join that conversation. But uh, yeah, yeah, fantastic book. I do recommend it. And um, I will also announce, oh, one more thing I do want to say about this is a, this is a thick book. It's like 540 pages, but the text is fairly large. Uh, the writing isn't too difficult, like, as far as, like, to comprehend. I mean, there's a lot to think about, but it's written in a very direct way, which I like, and, um, I, it, it shouldn't, it shouldn't take you that long to get through it, even though it's, um, it's 540 pages, but it's definitely not a little novella or anything like that. It's a, it's a big kind of sprawling book that takes place over seven years and really does get deep into each um, theme that I kind of went over very quickly. So that's the last thing about that. Um, going forward, uh, I wanted to announce one more book that I will be reading shortly, or starting to read shortly, besides the, the one from China, Outlaws of the Marsh, or Water Margin, which of course I'm still working on. And that's going to be a while. I might, just to keep things spread out, I might start another book from Asia um, that I can finish a little quicker because I'm trying to keep the regions balanced as far as what I'm reading. But anyway, this is this is this book I definitely will be starting soon. El Siglo de las Luces, or in English, um, Explosion in a Cathedral, which actually means something completely different, but I'll talk about that in the video for this book. Um, Alejo Carpentier is the author from Cuba, and uh, he is one of Cuba's most, you know, greatest authors. Um, and uh, this book actually, I think, was published very shortly after the Cuban Revolution. So it's got some interesting subtext that you could look into there, but and I don't know if I will in the video. But um, the, the, the main reason this was the book that I chose is because along with Pedro Paramo, um, El Siglo de las Luces was one of the books that greatly influenced Gabriel Garcia Marquez in writing 100 Years of Soledad. And there's an interesting story behind that. Um, that I picked up, and we'll have to verify its accuracy, but I, uh, basically, Gabriel Garcia Marquez had to start over after reading this book, because it just blew him away, and, um, so yeah, after reading those two, then I can think about, okay, I'm gonna take a bonus episode to explore 100 Years of Soledad, or just read it outside this project, because it's so influential, and uh, I can't, I just, I just can't bear to be alive without reading that book for much longer. So, so yeah, that's, that's next coming up on the agenda. Um, other than that, thank you all for watching. Uh, as always, feel free to reach out to my email or, uh, which is listed on my channel page or uh, comment on the videos. Please like and subscribe if uh, you enjoy. And uh, that's all I have. Thank you so much and have a great day.